October's been quite a month, hasn't it? And it's not over yet. Here at Chester Road Baptist Church, we've been following a series through the Sermon on the Mount. And during October, we've chunked it down to kingdom, not empire. And as part of that, we've looked at four things. Resistance. Jesus calls us to stand up against oppressors, but to use radical non-violence. Reconciliation. That Jesus calls us to radical love. Not just to love those who are like us, but actually to love even our enemies. Repentance. That actually all of us have to change our thinking, change our attitude, change our direction, bringing a bit of heaven on earth. And today, reparations, when saying sorry isn't always enough. Jesus deals first with violence. He says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders shall be subject to judgment. Now you don't need to be a Christian a Christ follower, to get this. It's true of all societies, all religions, communities. We all think murder, the deliberate taking of an innocent life, is wrong. And when that happens, we think the person who does this, they deserve punishment. Those who are left behind deserve justice. And we all deserve protection. But Jesus goes further. Violence doesn't start when the red mist in that split second comes over and that decision to knife someone. It starts way before. It begins with unspoken resentment smouldering, when increasing anger fans into flames and when left unchallenged, that fire begins to rage out of control. Then Jesus says, if you even start down the road, you'll be in danger of the fire of hell. But when Jesus speaks of what is often translated as hell, he wasn't heaping judgment, condemnation on people. He wasn't threatening some kind of future cosmic eternal punishment. You'd better do X, otherwise if you don't, when you die, you'll go to hell. No, no, Jesus was talking about a real place, a place known as Gehenna. It was where the uh, Jerusalem, the rubbish dump was. It was a hellish place where all the city's rotting rubbish and corpses were dumped. Dumped there because unlike the privileged, they weren't thought worthy enough to warrant a full proper funeral. And where previous generations had sacrificed children to Moloch. I mean, what contortions must that previous generations have gone through to convince themselves that it was ever okay to murder innocent children for their own gratification? You dump bodies on a refuse dump when you think they're trash, when you cease to see them as people, beautifully, wonderfully made in God's image. You sacrifice children, kill them, when you see them as nothing more than religious artefacts, fuel for the temple fire, not people like us. Jesus was saying, if you treat people like they are somehow less worthy, less human, less beautifully made in God's image, then you too could find yourself dumped on Gehenna. Because not only are you killing, denying their humanity, their life, you're also killing something, denying something of your own humanity too. When you start to see people as not us, a problem to be overcome, an enemy to be defeated, or when you start to view them as somehow inferior to you, then you're on the road to Gehenna, that hellish place. Don't go there. Wise up. Repent before it's too late. Change your thinking. So many of our problems today arise because we see people not as quite human, not quite like us. I mean, how, for example, were the Nazis ever able to do what they did in the 1930s and 40s? How were they allowed to kill? How were they helped to kill six million Jewish people plus a further five million others, those not like us? Gypsies, travellers, 
those with disabilities, those born gay, or who thought deliber uh, deliberately. The Holocaust became possible, even inevitable, with the dehumanising of people. The hell of Gehenna that treated others as less than human. We need to be hugely wary of those who use dehumanising language today. For example, when speaking of refugees or of the LGBT communities or of people of colour and so forth. Likewise, today we look back into our history and we struggle to understand how the British Empire and other colonial powers permitted, even encouraged and definitely profited from the transatlantic slave trade. Again, it was the dehumanising of people, the slippery slope to Gehenna. 12 million people were taken as slaves. You could only do this if you convinced yourself that they were less than human, a commodity, a resource. Between 15 to 20 percent died en route. That's at least 2 million people. And many didn't just die. They were thrown overboard because they'd become too weak, too sick. If they were sold in that condition, they would have fetched a lower price on arrival. And now with the insurance industry developing, if a slave died, the slave trader could instead claim on the insurance. So mid-Atlantic, they would literally throw the sickest slaves overboard to drown at sea so they could claim on the insurance. That sounds like to us murder, but they'd convince themselves they were transporting cargo, not people like us. The crime started way before that final moment. It began with the whole new industries that were created to maximise the profit. It began when new, more efficient cargo ships were designed and built to transport the maximum number of not quite human cargo. It began when we saw the new labour market as a way to get cheap goods. It began when some in the church even taught that people of colour were of a different race and then even that somehow that they were less than human white people. Whatever form the killing, whatever form the dehumanising takes, it all has the same root, seeing others as somehow less than us, not quite seeing the humanity, the godness in them. So again, that's why today it's really important that we call out those who are using dehumanising language today, whenever, wherever we hear it, see it. Jesus was so right to alert us to what happens when we see people as other, less than us. I think it's time to do a bit of cooking. During lockdown, like a lot of people, I've done more cooking. Today, it's spaghetti bolognese, and for that, I'm going to need an onion. If I don't put onion in my food, it's going to be bland, tasteless. I need the onion. Now, of course, onion is not the only ingredient. I've got tomatoes, I've got pesto, I've got garlic and various other things that are going to go on. But nevertheless, I need onion. If, though, I take my onion and I simply just drop it in the pan, well, that's not going to work, is it? Because in order to get the full benefit the full flavour of the onion, I've got to prepare it. I've got to engage with it. So I cut it through, and then, well even that isn't enough, I can see all the layers to it, but actually, I'm gonna to need to actually prepare it, engage with this onion. And that means peeling it back. And the thing about peeling an onion is that you start with one layer, and then you realise there's more. There's more to this onion than I ever realised. And so we pair back a little bit more, another layer, another layer, and so it goes on. Some don't like to engage with onion because it makes them feel uncomfortable. There's something released within it when we engage with it that we find it just releases our tear ducts. And so they avoid the onion altogether. But if you do that, you don't get the full benefit, the full effect. And so sometimes, despite how we feel, it's just important 
that we press through to get the full benefit for our cooking. Onions aren't the only vegetable, they're not the only ingredient, but they are an important one. And it's really important that we engage sometimes because then our cooking, our flavour, has the full effect. I wonder how this is going to turn out. Of course, I'm not here as your TV chef. I'm your minister. And this onion is really an illustration. An illustration of racial justice. Racial justice has, like this onion, many layers. We can treat it clumsily, drop it in, don't get the full effect. We can slightly engage with it by just peeling back the outer layer. But even then, we don't quite get the full effect. Racial justice, for the full effect, we realise it's just got multi, multi layers. And just when I think that I've engaged with racial justice, I realise there's more layers to it than I ever realised. And so it's really important that we engage with racial justice, not just as a superficial outer level, but actually at a deeper level, going through the layers, even if that means at times making us feel uncomfortable or others feel uncomfortable. Because the benefit for us all, for the flavour of the whole dish, is just worth it. Peeling back the layers on racial justice and reminding ourselves again just how vile, how evil the slave trade was. How colonial powers like Britain used oppression to plunder the wealth of other nations, particularly from Africa and Asia, to boost our own wealth and privilege. And that this is one of the reasons why these nations are often so economically behind Britain at this time today. Then it's not surprising that we start to ask if we should make reparations, make amends for our past wrongs. Jesus said, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. If you know you've hurt someone, don't try to carry on as if nothing has happened. Don't think it's okay to keep rocking up for worship, singing your songs of praise, when all the time you know that you've caused somebody real pain. You know, they know, God knows. As important as worship is, and it is, if that's you, drop everything. Go and seek reconciliation. Repent, change your thinking, change your attitude, say sorry and get that broken relationship fixed. Remember, they are your brothers and sisters. They're family, we're family together. Treat them that way. Now we can apply this on a global historical basis too. If we as Britain know we've caused real pain to others, now or in the past, shouldn't we too also seek reconciliation? Owning our own shared guilt and responsibility a corporate sin, if you like, seeking forgiveness and reconciliation. Trying to carry on like colonial slave trading isn't an issue today. Well, it's, it's not really an option. So it's quite right that we repent, say sorry. But as ever, radical Jesus doesn't leave it there. He goes further still. He says, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, Jesus says, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. If you know you've done wrong, and it's caused others real pain, hardship, then compensate them. Don't think you can end by just saying sorry, and that's the end of it. Imagine I stole something from you, and if I eventually said sorry, but still refused to hand back what I'd stolen from you, what would you think of my apology? Jesus says, settle matters, and quickly, don't drag your heels. Just because I stole stuff, your stuff, a while back, well, you'd still expect me to pay it back, wouldn't you, to hand it over? 
No one would say, well, because you stole it a long time ago, you can keep it. After all, finders keepers. We know on a personal level, it doesn't work like that. Don't make the one you've hurt, the one you've caused real pain, to relive their pain by having to pursue you through the courts. Remember, you're the one in the wrong. So settle, pay up. We totally get this when we are the ones that have been wronged. Then we want them not only to apologize, we want our stuff back. We want them to return what they've taken from us. And if that's true for us, then surely it's true for our brothers and sisters, for others too, that have been hurt. Jesus was speaking, not only radically, he was speaking in a real common sense way, in a way that just makes sense of how life works. Jesus, in fact, was speaking to all of us. Maybe you think this morning, he's speaking to you today. If you know that you've hurt somebody, either recently or even way back, why don't you apologise? Take the initiative. But sometimes saying sorry isn't actually enough. Sometimes we've got to go further to put things right, to return something, to recompense somebody, to make reparations. And when we do that, we affirm their humanity. But we also recognise our own humanity. We become more fully human. Later on, we're going to hear from Dennis in conversation, and we're going to talk more about reparations. Really important topic. It's not just a radical political message. It's a message that comes from the Gospels, from Jesus himself, his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Kingdom, not empire.